it was good to be reconnected with uh, alum, alumni as well as uh, friends, many friends uh, and familiar faces here in the room. Let me begin by uh, saying that uh, it is very difficult to see this It's a nice presentation, but it's difficult, so uh, I'm going to kind of be maybe back and forth in between. All right, so let me begin by saying this. We are leading organizations in a time of tremendous crisis, conflict, and massive institutional failure. A time of painful endings and hopeful beginnings. It's a transitional period that feels as if something is profoundly shifting and dying, while something else wants to be born. I don't know how many of you all agree with that statement. But the fact of the matter is we can talk about reimagining theological education and get the same thing that we've been doing. How many of you all have been in a conversation within the last five years about reimagining theological education? <laughs> Have you figured out the answers yet? Do you sense that you're going to figure it out today or over the course of this weekend? We have till 2 o'clock tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> the reason I ask the question is because I wonder how long do we want to continue to have a conversation about reimagining? How long do we want to continue to look at the data which we already know from you? How long will we be uh, okay with running institutions that are struggling, that are trying to navigate large um, debt, the change within uh, the educational uh, structures in terms of which and in, in ways we pay for that education. We're leading organizations in a time of tremendous crisis and massive institutional failure, a time of painful endings and hopeful beginnings. It's a transitional period that feels as if something profound is shifting and dying while something else wants to be born. If we always do what we've always done, we'll always have what we have. Until we're willing to do something different, we will continue to have what we have. I know it's a tough spot to be where you are. In institutions where you are stewarding a tradition and the work of a people who have long come before you. But the thing is that what we have inherited is not sustainable. It's not. The form, the delivery system of how we go about providing theological education is not sustainable. It may have been 100 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago, but the delivery system of theological education is not sustainable. The tradition will continue on, but the form in which we operate in and out of and deliver is not sustainable. So why do we work day and night trying to sustain a form that's just not possible to be sustained, given the new economic realities in which we live? And what are we willing to do different what courage does it require for us to muster? What bold steps do we need to take to break and depart from the normal ways in which we conduct our business? I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater, but the question is how do we begin doing some small experimentation? Where's our laboratory? 
Where's the place where you can think creative imaginatively without having to come in day after day being a firefighter trying to put out the multiple fires within your institution? As well as to carry on your research, faculty meetings, committee meetings, tenure uh, track meetings, and if you're embedded in a larger university, a whole other set of meetings. How do you create breathing space to be able to imagine and see something different? And then, not to just change your whole institution, but to begin small, experiment, finding the laboratory, tinkering with something, prototyping with it, scaling it, getting feedback, redoing it over again, and then how it, see how it might scale and bloom into the future. I say that we always, have, yeah, I oftentimes say this within and amongst my colleagues that the church has beautiful language about renewal and transformation, about grace and living and dying and resurrection. But we, we're not willing to allow our institutions to die and be resurrected. <laughs> So I want to talk to you a little bit about multiple pathways because part of it is if you're going to be reimagining, the question I guess in my mind is reimagining theological education for the sake of what? And for the sake of whom? And is it in, 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 in reimagining it, is it reimagining in a way in which, you know, we we got some things we're going to do, uh, and we're going to kind of, you know, create a new curriculum, new program, and see who will come to that. Well, is it about getting out of our own institutions, going down into Hyde Park and South Side of Chicago and other places, and being in and amongst the people to hear and see what they need? That being in close proximity to them, that we might see something anew. We might reimagine the way in which we deliver theological education, which oftentimes feel like the church, a come and see us kind of structure, versus the go where people are kind of structure. So, we know about the changing landscape, changes within the global religious landscape. For instance, Christianity is the largest religion in the world. But you know what? Muslims are the second fastest and right behind them and within the next 35 years wild pace Christianity. The other thing is, is that globally 2040 has already come. Who knows what 2040 is? Who doesn't know what it is, I should say. <laughs> so 2040 is this kind of imaginary timeline where it is anticipated that there will be no longer a, uh, a racial ethnic majority. This will be a period where we'll have multiple diversity within the country. Well, globally, it's already come. 6% of Christianity, of Christians, live in the three largest continents where uh, persons of color majority um, live. as Sub-Saharan Africa, as Latin America, and it's uh, Asia. Sixty percent of the world's Christian population are in those three continents. The other thing is that the unaffiliates across the globe are on a decline, where it's on an incline here in the United States. Unaffiliates meaning the religious nuns, those who are disaffiliating from organized religion. Doesn't mean that they're not Christian, doesn't mean that they're not even issued in God or faith, but the ways in which they orient, and the ways in which they track, they disassociate themselves from uh, formal kinds of uh, religious practice. So Christianity is changing in North America. And the question then is, what are the challenges that we see. Well, the first is we see that over the next 35 years, Christianity is going to is going to decline by a third. And somewhere, Pew has said that about 173 million is sold to drop a third. The second one is that the unaffiliates, those 
who are disaffiliated from organized religion is on the rise, and that is driven mostly by millennials. Third, you have racial ethnic diversity, and within uh, some communities, particularly out west in some of those schools, we see that even seminary enrollment is already a majority of persons of color. The 2040 has already come in some institutions. And then finally, millennials are driving this new way. They're not like your boomers or your Gen Xers. And we're still trying to get a handle on who this uh, population is. But one thing we do know is that they're the largest generation that we've seen in our time. <coughs> they have surpassed the boomers. And they represent the largest group within the workforce, surpassing Gen X. They carry a high student debt. They really want to make a difference in the world. And they want a meaningful career where they, where they can actually make a living. And they are participating in ways, uh, they're participating in life where they're building community through social media and, 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 and other kinds of mediums of building and knitting together their community of support. But one of the things we also realize that our institutions are stressed. I don't know if uh, Stephen is here, uh, he's still here, but he left. But one of the things that we know is that 73% uh, of freestanding ATS institutions are carrying debt of $250,000 to a million dollars. And 27% are in the black. If Dan Alshire was here, he would tell me that our industry is fragile. We know that enrollment is on the decline. But where is the growth in the enrollments? With and among persons of color. And part of what they experience within their programs, and it's part of what we do at ATS, is help uh, doctoral students of color navigate their programs and hopefully find meaningful careers and help uh, institutions who want to attend to the barriers to diversity within their own respective institutions is issues of imperialism, issues of white privilege and superiority. That's a fact. So we're gonna reimagine, we can't skirt around those particular realities. And it's not, it's not a matter of switching one race for another race or taking another group's position or power. It's about the complexity of issues that we face within our field, within our industry, within the broader church. No one person or group has the answer themselves. That only the collective wisdom that can be curated out of a collective room like this can come up with the kind of collective intelligence that's necessary to address the complexity as well as the opportunities in which we face. So I'm thankful for gatherings like this because it gets us out of our own kind of denominational, church, institutional kind of silos. And hopefully can be designed in such a way in which we can have a different kind of conversation. So the question really is, I, can't, I know you can't see this, but it's a finger bust in the bubble. The question is, is can reimagining theological education burst the bubble of imperialism in which your school grows out of, out of white supremacy and privilege? Can I reimagining theological education do that? 
Because if not, what are we here for? Because the people who are coming and the people that we want to see, they need us to ascend to our higher selves and our better angels. To create an environment which all of us can thrive. You know, when I became president uh, uh, four years ago, um, I went and did a listen to it because I wanted to hear what are the kind of leaders that we need now. What kind of leaders that the church and the world need now? And I realized that within our institution, we didn't have the answers to that. I also realized that the people that we were recruiting for ministry and teaching were also going into a particular system. Some of them were going to go into pre-existing systems and others were going to participate in being the, being the midwives and shepherding a new system that is to come. So this comes from, uh, this whole kind of systems diagram comes from um, Chris Corrigan and others who have been working on um, kind of organizational change and looking at uh, the natural environments, the ways in which things change. So what I want to first draw your attention to is that there's a faint line here that kind of separates kind of an invisible versus an invisible world. And what we have is this type of overarching kind of older system of influence. That part of what we have inherited is a system that was grounded within an industrial age of kind of producing, minting out students for a particular profession. There wasn't a lot of kind of um, divergence in the sense of how you, you know, how you do that, but every tradition had their way of training their particular leaders, and it was about making these kind of leaders like you have within a kind of industrial age. And many of us find ourselves in different places of leadership on this kind of continuum. So this, this older system of fluence, some people are stewarding the institutions in which they are inherited. Even I am doing that uh, within my own respective institution. At some point, the influence of the institution begins to wane. And as it begins to wane, just as in organizational life, in life cycles, like in human life cycles, there's a period of decline and ultimately hostile. There's still a lot of energy and hope in that, but the fact of the matter is that this organizational life cycle is, you know, is such where it moves to hospice. And there is some mourning and lamenting of that. I say this all the time. But those of us who are beneficiaries of a theological education, particularly a residential theological education, we value that. What happens? We don't want anybody going into a non residential education. Perish the that is less than, not equated to real theological uh, way of, of training and form. But the fact of the matter, there was a time before people were going through residential education to be trained. It was a whole different system, and then that came out of the came out of scene. So as people, some of what we have within our institution is the lament and the mourning of what was. And really trying to be faithful even unto death of that which has been given to us. But there are some of you who've stepped out of those respective roles and said, you know, I really want to begin thinking about how, how to pioneer what's next to come. Philip's one of those persons. Call me up. I want to figure out what's next to come. And I'm gathering some folks together who are going to be innovators and pioneers of whatever it is to come. We don't know what's to come, but we're, we're moving faithfully into the mystery of life. And so those pioneers, they began to kind of come together and think about what's possible. And then they find themselves in different networks within their own cities or regions 
and they get together and share ideas and begin formulating what's possible in that context. And then at some point, those networks begin to form and gel into a community of practice. How do we can get together on a regular basis and have conversations about what it is that we're trying to prototype and scale? And maybe you can give a, provide a feedback loop in terms of what's possible. At some point, those practicing communities around the country begin to give shape to a new emerging system of influence. In some sense, this overarching is kind of like the life and death of any system, like within our traditions, life and death. This new emergence is kind of a, is, is like resurrection. What is to come? It's a new form, it's a different body, it's a changed body, but we recognize it because of a long tradition which we've inherited that's being carried forward. But it's not the same form, model, system which we once had. That at some point the golden years of, of what we may have thought was at one particular time is no longer. And the real question is what are you going to do in your watch? So what we recognize is that some of the pathways in the ministry track into this existing system. And some pathways in the ministry track into this new emerging system of influence. And part of the question is, where are you on this system, living and dying system? And where is your institution? Are you wearing multiple hats? Are you wearing one hat more uh, um, majority than the other hat? Where do you fall in this particular system? And how do where you fall line up where your institution your institution falls. So part of this is about mapping yourself on the system, but it also gives you at least a frame, not the frame, but a frame of how these systems emerge and how new systems, uh, how one system uh, evolves and how the other one devolves and kind of converges with the other. Part of this is coming to the recognition of, of, of this whole idea of how do you and I engage in what I would call a vocation-centered design? Which is to say we don't start in curriculum meeting and start reimagining how we do curriculum. But we start with, what is God up to? Not in my institution. But what is God up to in the communities in which my institution is embedded in? And what do God's people need? Not what I assume they need. But how do I get close and listen on the ground? How do I come and break bread with them at the table? How do I hear from them in the midst of Worship and what they're going through day in and day out in these communities of faith. How do I listen to those who are on the ground working for justice and social service advocacy? And then how do their experiences in listening to them, going through many, like a little mini listening tour, listening and hearing them into deeper speech may inform what I bring back to that curriculum committee. Or do we don't do that because, you know what, that might just mess up our faith. But it starts with the needs, the context of God's people and where God is actively involved. The second thing is that it's about what is faithfully possible. Given what I've heard, what can we faithfully do in our respective institution to address that need? For such a time as this, that God is doing something new. And then, the thing that I'm dreaming up, is it sustainable? The thing is, is that reimagining, innovating,
elevation and scale is at the center of that Venn diagram. The innovation happens at the margins of multiple worldviews. And the question is, how are we bumping up with enough diverse worldviews than ours that may actually help us see anew? So in some, in some cases, reimagining theological education is a backward design. It starts not with your committee, not with your board, not with your president. Well, of course, you need your president's uh, support. But it starts with getting out in the communities, which institutions, which theological institutions are in service to, and the people, and hearing what they need. And then it's moving back from that and trying to understand the broader context in which we live in. And then from there, is then, okay, so what, what, what might we do as educators uh, to train and, and develop a new kind of uh, leader? So part of this is about understanding ministry and realizing that ministry, what it may have been 50 years ago, is not necessarily the way it should be understood today. It can include an understanding 50 years ago, but it should be more expansive to include other ways in which we're thinking about ministry and doing ministry. And so part of what we understand about ministry in the context is that there are some 21st century disruptive innovations that have impacted the way that we think about and how ministry has to understand its own work. The first one being... I can't see it, so. But the first one is um, social media. Not the internet, but the way that we're social with the ways in which we engage online and offline media. This kind of push and pull has changed the game in ways in which we're doing ministry, understand ministry, and even uh, should be informing theological education. Can you imagine lecturing in a classroom, you're getting all these tweets or whatever as folks who are in your classroom as well as folks around the globe tuning into what your lecture as you got someone in the back of the room who's actually tweeting your lecture as you speak. The other piece of this is the smartphone and tablets. It used to be a time where we would carry books in our book, in our backpack, or in our satchel, or even a leather strap. Now we can carry it all on our iPads and our uh, and our uh, galaxies and and everything else. That we can access our theological library right where we are. We don't have to come to the particular school. What does all that mean? Those are disruptive innovations. That should be changing the way we think about theological education in curriculum and design. So an evolving understanding of uh, evolving understanding of ministry has to realize that it's ministry in congregations and the traditional forms of ministry in terms of congregations, campus ministry, denominational work, missionary work, uh, chaplaincy, to think about ministry in the world. How do we move from the parochial spaces which we see to actually being the hands and feet of Christ in the broader community? And how do you build the capacity of the students beyond just being inheritors of a particular tradition to actually transform that in a way that actually helps them to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world? But part of understanding ministry then will be shaped by who's exploring ministry. And so just quickly, um, millennial Christians, they want to make a difference in the world and they want to live a faithful life of service and scholarship. The other thing is, is that uh, they want to serve the church, but to them most often that means serving the church's mission in the world. Ministry is the way that they follow Jesus, not their commitment to membership in the institutional church. 
and they are, they tend to be, not all of them, but more and more what we see with millennials is this accepting or embracing of religious pluralism, tolerance, and multi-faith cooperation. So what does it mean to be Christian in a religious plural uh, context? All of those factors are shaping multiple pathways. So there's a there's a map here. It's got a highway and then like a it's like in California, like if you had one of those earthquakes, like the road just kind of sinks in, like a big sink in, a sinkhole in the middle of the uh, of the interstate. And the question is, so what do theological schools do when long when long standing pathways or maps? are no longer adequate. It's just not adequate. Not to say they're not important, but they're not adequate. They're not sufficient. They're not all-inclusive in terms of giving folks all of they need to launch away of the ministry. <laughs> well, there, there are four uh, pathways that I want to mention, and then I'm going to turn it over and let you hear a couple case studies. So the first is um, there's a traditional pathway and I would put let me preface by saying this this kind of typology suggests that there's not a pure a purist kind of form meaning that people fall in this uh, fall in one of the four but they also are a hybrid between one of the four, in, in, in any case or whatever, you know, they may even be a little divergent from, from the four that I was going to name. But the first one is the traditional pathway. And it is the privilege, it is the, norm, it is the normative privilege pathway that people who are middle class, who learn how to navigate institutions, typically uh, take this path. They're usually college edu educated. They're usually persons who either go from college to graduate school and on to ministry. I would even put second career folks in the traditional pathway. Folks who go to college, they go serve, they get a call to ministry, and then they come back to seminary. That's those kind of persons. The second one is um, the alternative pathway. In the alternative pathway, what we have are persons who may go to a junior college. Or like uh, when I was out um, several years meeting with Philip, I met with uh, some, uh, some other leaders. Uh, the Latin American Bible Institute has more than 1,100 uh, young, young adults who are basically in a junior college. But all intents and purposes, it basically is a theological school. They all have to do an internship within a church. They got to take, you know, Bible courses in addition to other things that prepare them. And most of the folks, at least in the Assembly of God's tradition, have gone through this particular institution and gone on into ministry. And then they may come back to a Fuller or a Claremont as part of their continuation. But it's not to validate that they've been called to ministry or it is the next journey in their preparation. But another form of alternative ministry also includes online, uh, online degrees and MOOCs. And the real question I have is what's going to be the breakout? What's going to be the, the Khan Academy of Theological Education? Because it's Khan. And in some cases, what you have is a hybrid between that alternative and the traditional. The next one quickly is... Um, the apprentice model. So some folks, they bypass uh, graduate theological education because it's too expensive. And if they're millennials, they already got undergraduate debt. And so they end up being apprenticed by a pastor. I was talking to a, a, a seminary president on the East Coast who says right down the street, there is a church that is apprenticing and teaching about a thousand folks. And we barely got a hundred. And part of what I'm trying to figure out is not to see them as competitors, 
but how do we see them as allies and how we can work together in supporting the training the folks that they're um, doing? How we see ourselves as a resource to them? But that apprentice model is, is what you see in uh, the Church of the Resurrection and other places where uh, who, are, who also is housing St. Paul Theological Seminary, but have very different ways. And hopefully there is some cooperation that can happen between those two forms of theological education. And then finally uh, is the kind of service advocacy model. It's a model where a person may do a faith-based service learning, immersion experience before or after college. Um, and then something happens, kind of like a Paul record or whatever. They, they become disoriented. And they have to find ways to reorient themselves. They become, they become aware of their own idiosyncrasies. They become aware of their own privileges. They become aware of their own biases. And then they begin working, sometimes putting their putting their education together by taking a certificate program in one place or going to do a, uh, a one-week training somewhere else. And they're putting those pieces together because what they really want to do is create a faith-based uh, social enterprise. That's just a fancy way of saying another form of doing kind of missional ministry. But draws on building capacity and knowing how to do a business plan and think about all the type of demographic studies that you got to look at. And also, you know, recognizing that the Spirit in God blesses that as well. And what you'll find is a, is a hybridity between all four of those different pathways, which could basically, you could create multiple pathways, but I want to just kind of narrow it down to four. These pathways <coughs> say something about what's broken within our institution. In terms of its costs, in terms of formation, in terms of accessibility. If the rising tide of this country is a more diverse context, and that diverse context of millennials <coughs> have high education debt, they will not be able to access traditional forms of theological education. And are not, they're creating their own forms. If Supremacy continues to run rampant. Privilege continues to run rampant. That folks don't come into their particular theological education and see their own story, hear their own people, and hear a more a broader canon that includes the diversity of the church and the theological worldviews that informs the richness within this body. Folks will continue to move and do theological education beyond your institutions. They have and they will continue. We see that with Paul Fieri with, you know, the theater, I mean, uh, with uh, liberators of the press. People are doing kind of base community forms of theological education, and they will continue to do that. The real question is how can we come together and figure out what we can do to come alongside them and work? The real task now is that we need to get to work. 